What's up on this Monday morning, July 8th? We have once again major cybersecurity news for the past week about July 1st onward. Volcano Demon ransomware makes threatening phone calls. We got a guy steals airplane passenger data. A new Intel CPU flaw that's just like Spectre and Meltdown from a few years ago. Ransoms being paid now are five times higher than they were a year ago. Formula One was breached. Brazil banned Meta AI. And both Cisco and Juniper network gear have a critical security flaw. This week's product pick is a better e-reader device. So I also started a Patreon for those who don't want to shop at Amazon and you want to support the channel. Also, I'm looking for affiliate ops opportunities elsewhere through affiliate channels, through Barnes and Noble and others. I'm also promoting bookshop.org, which supports local bookstores, has a huge library and still ships quickly. In this week's resource reveal, I'll share a free and cheap way to start learning cybersecurity or dive into offensive security, also known as OFSEC, where you can practice hacking and other cool stuff. So stay tuned for that. And in our deep dive, we're going to go over Wi-Fi evil twin attacks, which is one of our news items as well. Don't trust that free Wi-Fi. Find out how that guy got airplane passengers data. Hey, I'm Mike Kramer, KramerNow.com, and I inform people about cybersecurity without expensive subscriptions by providing the latest cyber news and resources. As always, we've got a lot of stuff to cover, so let's dive right into it. The Evolve Bank breach that was uh, formerly announced as the Federal Reserve Bank breach, which was incorrect. Uh, the Affirm Payment Plan Provider and many others are emerging as victims. This all started from an Evolve employee that clicked on a link in a phishing email, so don't click links. Instead, either see where that link goes or go to their website directly. It helps to have some sort of technology or Gmail or something that's helping scan your emails for phishing and malware and spam, but they're not gonna catch everything, so you need to be diligent as well. They are getting more clever with these phishing attacks, and that's basically where somebody's sending you an email and they are trying to get you to either download something, click something, go to a website under details, download a software or whatever. In this case, the attackers leaked the data because the victim refused to pay the ransom. So in the past, with pure crypto lockers, you could just restore your data from backup and you'd be fine. Crypto locker is where they're locking you, preventing you from accessing your, your system or your data and they encrypted it. So those were known as crypto lockers. Other methods attackers use were just known as lockers. They didn't always encrypt. That's the difference between lockers and crypto lockers. So before you could just restore from backup, you'd be fine getting rid of all the ransomware and getting your data back from before an attacker encrypted it all. But now the attackers often steal the data first, they exfiltrate it somewhere, then they encrypt and lock, then they demand a ransom. So if you don't pay, they release that private data and you're still dealing with a breach that you have to report to the public, which can kill your stock price, consumer confidence, and have huge financial impact because you have to report the breach by law. Or do you? A recent US Supreme Court ruling may lift federal requirements to report breaches as it reversed a 40-year legal precedent that some think will weaken all federal cybersecurity regulations. What does this mean? For example, many current cybersecurity disclosure regulations could be lifted or weakened, such as the SEC requires a breach to be disclosed in four days. The FCC requires stronger breach notification rules when consumer data is leaked. In a stunning reversal of nearly 40 years of regulatory law in Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo, the court voted six to three last week to gut a legal precedent known as the Chevron Deference. Decided in a 1984 Supreme Court case, the movie Runaway with Tom Selleck comes to mind with computers back in 1984, but I digress. So back in 1984, the Supreme Court case, Chevron instructed lower courts to defer to expert regulatory agencies in cases requiring interpretation of congressional intent. Might need Jordan as my lawyer to figure out what half that means, but basically people are worried about looser regulations and less reporting on breaches and things like that in the future. There's been a 500% rise in the average ransomware payment in just the past year. The average payment is now $2 million, up from just $400,000 a year ago. These attacks are becoming more prevalent and and sophisticated due to their relative success in extorting a payout by victims. Generative AI has enabled attackers to write much more convincing phishing emails with better grammar and spelling, making it harder to detect a phishing email and it's tricking people into defeating MFA or multi-factor authentication, which as I reported last week is showing its weaknesses as it gives people a false sense of security. MFA is being defeated by phishing emails that trick users to give up their MFA credentials. They also use SIM swapping where attackers can take over your mobile phone number and receive
achieve your MFA challenges, man in the middle attacks, and malware that allow attackers that can intercept your comms and capture your MFA tokens. Social engineering where they trick people into revealing their MFA or by exploiting a weak MFA reset process where they defeat MFA completely, resetting it to their own devices by leveraging breached personal information. So those are all the ways typically defeating MFA nowadays. Most next-gen MFA involves some form of biometrics, and there's been a lot of pushback against how that personal biometric data is stored. It's a new ransomware attacker referred to as Volcano Demon by researchers uses a new locker software known as Luca Locker that encrypts files with the extension .nba and also makes threatening phone calls to victims from a no-caller ID phone number to extort a ransom also clearing logs. Uh, Indonesia ransomware, identified as Brain Cipher. They've attacked over 200 government agencies worldwide. It appears their malware was created using LockBit 3.0 Builder, then modified it to also encrypt file names and leaves ransom notes. Like many other modern ransomware attacks, they first exfiltrate data and threaten to release it and leak the data in addition to extorting victims to decrypt their data. There's a new Intel Spectre-like attack. An attacker can use the tactic to essentially trick the CPU into making incorrect speculative executions and leak sensitive data. In January 2018, Spectre and Meltdown were two CPU side channel attacks that could leak information. Researchers at the University of California, San Diego have found a new way to execute Spectre-like side channel attacks against high-end Intel CPUs currently including the recent Raptor Lake and Alder Lake microprocessors. Like Spectre, the new technique, which the researchers have dubbed Indirector, exploits a speculative execution feature in the Intel CPUs to redirect the control flow of a program. That is, the order in which it executes individual instructions and function calls. Fake IT support sites push malicious PowerShell scripts as window fixes. They're also being promoted by hijacked YouTube channels, which give them some credibility. They do that to seem more legit. In particular, the threat actors are creating fake videos now promoting a fix for the common error 0x800-70643. Uh, it was an error that millions of Windows users have been dealing with since January. And so they're using that so that when people look it up, YouTube is owned by Google, it's promoted in their search engine results, and they're getting directed now to these, uh, and they're also running ads for this, and they're using this to promote and get people to click on and get people to run these malicious PowerShell scripts. There's been a Formula One racing data breach, so F1's governing body says attackers gained access to personal data after compromising several F1A email accounts in a phishing attack. That might be FIA, F1A or FIA. It's uh, F1's governing body. You could probably look that up. Data stolen on an airline flight using Wi-Fi. Now Australian cops arrested the man found with a portable Wi-Fi access device in his carry-on luggage, and he allegedly used that for standing up scam Wi-Fi networks on flights where people would log in and provide credentials, and he stole all those credentials without them knowing. Stay tuned for today's deep dive to see how we pulled it off and how to protect yourself against this. The country of Brazil has banned Meta, who owns Facebook and Instagram, from processing users' data to train Meta AI. They were citing evidence of processing of personal data based on inadequate legal hypothesis, lack of transparency, limitation of the rights of data subjects, and risks to children and adolescents. Next, global police operation shuts down 600 cybercrime servers linked to Cobalt Strike. Now, a lot of them weren't active anymore, but Cobalt Strike is a popular adversary simulation and pen testing tool. It's a penetration testing tool developed by Fortra that was formerly Help Systems, offering IT security experts a way to identify weaknesses in security operations and incident responses. As previously observed by Google and Microsoft, cracked versions of the software have found their way into the hands of malicious actors who have time and again abused it for post-exploitation purposes. Cobalt Strike is the Swiss army knife of cyber criminals and nation state actors, says the vice president of threat intelligence at SecureWorks and shared that with the Hacker News. Now, Cobalt Strike has long been the tool of choice for cyber criminals, including as a precursor to ransomware. So you can imagine nowadays it's quite popular. It's also deployed by nation state actors like Russian and Chinese to facilitate intrusions in cyber espionage campaigns. It's used as a foothold and has proven to be quite effective at providing a persistent backdoor to victims. 
If you want to learn more about tools used by attackers and defenders alike, stay tuned for my resource reveal later in this episode. FakeBat, loader malware, spreads widely through drive-by download attacks. FakeBat, also known as Ugen Loader and PayK Loader, has been offered to other cybercriminals under an LAAS subscription model on underground forums by a Russian-speaking threat actor named Eugenfest, aka PayK34, <laughs> since at least December 2022. It's a loader as a service, that's the LAAS, kind of like software as a service, but for bad guys. Uh, so loader as a service has become one of the most widespread loader malware families distributed using the drive-by download technique this year. So if you have money to burn and you want to go to jail, the malware is available for just $1,000 per week and $2,500 per month for the MSI format. <laughs> Drive-by attacks entail the use of methods such as search engine optimization poisoning, malvertising, and nefarious code injections into compromised sites to entice users into downloading bogus software installers or browser updates. I'm not going to talk about all those techniques today. They are in the MITRE uh, matrix that we looked at last week, and we can cover those in future episodes. Now, Chinese attackers exploiting Cisco switches zero-day vulnerability to deliver malware. So it's not just Cisco network products with critical security flaws. Juniper Network released a critical security update for routers. <sighs> so there have been so many cybersecurity news stories. Honestly, when I started this show just a few weeks ago, I never thought there'd be this many huge cybersecurity headlines each week. I hear about a couple of them normally, and then the more you read, the more you find out, and it's almost terrifying. I'm reporting about half of the big ones, and then there are countless other smaller headlines. Let's move on to our product pick of the week. I read all of my YouTube comments and saw some of you saying that you don't shop at Amazon, so you don't want to support them with my affiliate links. I get it. I have a love-hate relationship with Amazon myself. So I am working hard to find alternative ways so you can help support this channel and help spread cybersecurity knowledge with others. So I've signed up for Patreon and to be an affiliate for other companies that either provide books, tech devices, services, and other stuff. So in this week's product pick, I'm featuring an alternative e-reader. So it's better than Kindle, but not as well known. It's an e-reader from Rakuten called the Kobo. K-O-B-O. -O. It's Marketing in the U.S. has kind of failed, so that's probably why you haven't heard of it, but it's a great product with cheaper unlimited book subscription for both reading or audible, and you can even get both for just $10 a month unlimited reading and audible. I applied as affiliate, so check the description and comments below for my link. I'll add one if I get the link uh, approved in the near future. Otherwise, buy it anyway. I still recommend it. The Kobo Book Reader, better than Kindle. You can check out all their models, but the recommended ones are the Kobo Clara. Uh, it's black and white for $130, or you can get a color one for $150. Join Kobo Plus for just $8 a month, or you can get both read and listening unlimited for just $10 a month. Why not use an iPad, you may ask? Well, I have an iPad too, but I really enjoy that e-ink or virtual ink that are on these e-reader devices. You could be out with your e-reader device in the park or on your patio or deck on a beautiful, bright, sunny day and still be able to see the e-ink and read it very well. It's a super clear. You can't do that with that high glare on an iPad or similar tablet. So it's just a world of difference. If you haven't tried it, you should check it out if you're an avid reader. And right in your pocket, you can have access to hundreds or even thousands of books right at your fingertips and take that everywhere you go. That's really hard to beat for portability. In this week's resource reveal, I'm gonna talk about tryhackme.com. So you can get started learning cybersecurity and offensive security. They have a free tier. They also have stuff around 10 bucks a month where you can get lessons as well as labs where you can actually hack stuff. And it's really cool. It's a great platform to get started on. Then you can move on to hackthebox.com. Both are great, but most recommend going in that order and starting with tryhackme.com. So it's not try to or anything else. I'll put the link below, but it's just tryhackme.com. I'm not an affiliate. I just think it's cool. So I want to share that with you guys. Let's get into this week's digital deep dive. We're going to talk about the Wi-Fi attack that happened on that airplane. Let's cover the what, what exactly happened. So people connected to what they thought was free public Wi-Fi. They entered their credentials to websites and stuff and their credentials got stolen. So why would somebody do that? Well, with credentials to various things, you can imagine the attacker can gain access to your computer and or accounts, lock you out of it, any of those accounts, multiple accounts, steal money, information, contacts, pose as you to your contacts and either spread malware, ask for money, ruin your rep reputation, or any of the other several items in the MITRE ATT&CK impact tactics category. 
And real quick, if you remember from last week, we could look at that on the matrix here, hold down shift, you can mouse scroll over to the right. And that last column or category out of the 14 is impact. And they may be looking to do any one or uh, multiple of these things. <laughs> That's another way to kind of use miter is say, hey, well, well, what would they do with, uh, with X? What are the bad things that could happen? Well, there's all sorts of these, uh, these fun things here. So now how did the attacker do this? He set up a Wi-Fi hotspot advertising itself with a convincing name like United Airlines Wi-Fi or Australian Airlines Wi-Fi or whatever it was. And you just wait for people to connect. Some people will do it and masquerade it as the airport name. This is known as masquerading. So it's MITRE TTP 1036. So let's go back to our MITRE screen right here. And it's uh, masquerading. It's in the category of defense evasion. And so if we go back from the beginning, yeah, here we go. Defense evasion. And you go down to, you'll see impersonation and a little further, because they are in alphabetic order, is masquerading. And that's 1036. If you click on it, you'll see this one does have sub techniques. And this one was uh, .005. So it's matching a legitimate name or location, meaning a legitimate name of the airline or the airport they're in to make people think they're connecting to free Wi-Fi available at that location. So if you click into that TTP for MITRE, you can read more about it here and see various examples used in the real world. There are quite a few. Uh, also mentions, of course, the mitigations and how to detect that sort of stuff. So that's always fun to read about. So that's why I was saying last week, it's not always left to right in the MITRE matrix. That's just in general, that's how people move. Remember, he didn't gain access to credentials using the masquerading. That's just how he evaded defenses. So people let their guard down, they connect to it, they put in their credentials. From there, attackers use credential access and or collection attacks to gather everything. So that would be like MITRE TTP 1557 or T1557. It's adversary in the middle. If we go back to the matrix here and look at credential access, here's adversary in the middle, T1557. Click on that and there are sub techniques there, which you can see right here. So, so this one isn't necessarily one of the sub techniques. It's really just in the T1557 because uh, who knows what he did exactly, but it's probably either in DNS settings, pointing them to fake websites he set up, or he could just be sniffing all the traffic and capturing all the credentials and everything they're typing. Now, ways to mitigate or prevent against this kind of attack is you can use in a VPN over Wi-Fi. It's much better to connect to the internet using your own private device, such as tethering to your mobile phone, or if you have a Wi-Fi device from your mobile provider. But at the very least, if you must use public Wi-Fi for some reason, at least use a VPN. It would have encrypted these victims' data and not allowed the attacker to see everything. When I travel, I turn off my Wi-Fi and everything on my laptop and mobile at all times, and we'll just connect through the cellular connection if needed from my laptop into that. And on top of that, you can use a VPN as well, but uh, never get on public Wi-Fi just by itself. All right, that's it for this week please check out my links in the description. It helps keep this channel going. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. I appreciated you guys uh, watching and taking the time out to leave comments. I enjoy reading them. I hope this helped at least one person out there. So I'll see you next time and stay safe out there.